Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning, welcome, delighted to be worshiping with you in this Lord's Day. Those of you who are here personally in attendance and those of you who may be worshiping online. So glad the Lord calls our paths to cross this Sunday and hope it'll be, sure, are confident it will be for our blessing. Please notice the opportunities for worship and study and fellowship and service, which you have printed in uh, your bulletin. Let me highlight a few things. A Walk for Life with the Community Pregnancy Center, which we endorse and uh, encourage you most enthusiastically to participate in, is coming up on September 21st. There are a few flyers in the back to pick up. Some, many of you last week received the um, sign-up sheet. You can do this on paper, as some of us old heads prefer to do, or for you younger guys, more with it, you can do it online. But the point is to sign up and participate so that we might have an extra boost for the work of the Community Pregnancy Center, which we already support, by the way, through our Faith Promise Giving uh, throughout the course of the year. Also, we're registering now for community groups. Start of a new church year means the start of new small group in-home Bible studies. We're offering three now by popular demand, and there are sign-up sheets available on the table in the back. There are two groups that are scheduled for Wednesdays that are going to meet twice a month, and there's one group scheduled for Sunday evening that'll meet every Sunday. The Wednesday group, one of them begins this week, as a matter of fact, and the Sunday group will begin, Lord willing, next Sunday, the 15th. And you can get all the details from the information that's displayed for you there on the back table. We're happy to welcome Mrs. Jennifer Thomas to be our guest pianist today. Uh, she is the middle school head for South Lake Christian Academy, uh, an engineer in the background somewhere, and uh, an excellent person to get to know if you don't know her already. Thank you so much for your help. She's filling in in Mike Wallace's absence. The last I heard from him this week, he was somewhere several thousand feet over the Great Barrier Reef, uh, taking pictures on a little vacation jaunt that he and Iris are enjoying this week. Also, Lisa McConnell is here. Lisa is the uh, web, web designer and a graphics artist for South Lake Christian Academy, and she's helping us here in the church update our website and our social media outlets. She's taking some pictures today, so don't be alarmed. Uh, that's by our invitation and will be used at our, our own discretion. Carolyn and I plan to be on vacation this coming week. Uh, Pastor Jason is lined up to preach next Sunday, and we'll see you in a few. <laughs> uh, let me mention, too, I ha had not thought about this until just then, saying see you in a few, but um, um, one of our members, Andrew Horde, is uh, shoving off for his first full-time professional job this Tuesday. And so this will be his last Sunday in the booth back there with us for some time. Andrew finished his master's uh, level studies in elect electrical engineering. Is it electrical? Something like that, yeah. And he's going up to Reston, Virginia to take up residence there and work in the D.C. area. So if you haven't done so today, give him a hug around the neck. It may be a while before you get another crack at him. Hear now God's word as he himself calls us to worship. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever. Let us pray. King Jesus, we bow our knee figuratively, symbolically before you now as we bow our heads, acknowledging you to be the Lord of our lives, the Lord of all that you've made. Sometimes we forget that, and so we pray that today, by the work of your Spirit, we would be renewed in our understanding, or deepened in our understanding of what it is that we have a King reigning in heaven. May we worship you as is befitting your kingly status. For your own name's sake, we ask it. Amen. Please stand as we sing our opening hymn.
Thank you. Please be seated. This morning we are focusing on the last of the three uh, offices, or the last in the threefold office of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've looked at prophet in a previous week, priest, last time today, to the third role, which is that of king. And we see a, um, a royal scene, a royal setting, uh, properly um, de- described and laid out for us in the fifth chapter of Revelation, uh, when the king will have come into his full and evident status. And so let us uh, open our scriptures and turn to Revelation, and I'll be reading the fifth chapter in its entirety. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth, or under the earth, could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept, because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the eleven elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp. And they were holding golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne, and the living creatures, and the elders, and in a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, and wealth, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and on the sea, and all that is in them, singing to Him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, be praise, and honor, and glory, and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. This is the Word of God, which is flawless, like silver refined in a furnace of clay, purified seven times. We come face to face with the majesty of this one in whose name we gather, this one whom we've come to worship. And if we are thinking right, if we are attentive in the least, whenever we come face to face this way with the Word of God and the revelations it brings, we're cast into a need, uh, into a state of helpless need, where we look for relief from the shortcomings of our lives. We know the Word of God has shown a white light, a straight line that is the standard of God's revealed will. And when we see that standard in Scripture, always we're reminded of how far we have varied, swerving to the left or to the right from this bright white line of righteousness. And that drives us to the need for, the desire for, confession and forgiveness. So in our prayers of confession now, you bow and silently acknowledge your sins before our righteous God, I'll have a corporate prayer and also will lead us in a word of assurance from Scripture. Let us pray.
King Jesus, forgive us the many, many times that we have undervalued you, the times we've undervalued your kingdom. The truth is, we've not always considered you all that worthy. We've not adequately appreciated you, not adequately appreciated your glory or your honor or your power. And our praise of you has been weak if it has been there at all. The magnitude of your majesty has, has escaped us. Your power to purchase with your blood all kinds of people from everywhere through all time and elevate them as priests and co-regents with you, we have not grasped. We've not adequately marveled at it. And so we pray, O oh Lord, that you would forgive us Forgive us and improve us, that you'd give us eyes to see more clearly your kingly reign, that we'd have minds able to conceive it more fully, hearts to rejoice in it more energetically as you reign over us in all that power and majesty and glory and all that it means for us, for our blessing, for our welfare, now and eternally. In your own great name we ask it. Amen. Here's a word of assurance from Scriptures. Christ Jesus has been slain, and with His blood He has purchased men for God. He has made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign forever and ever. Believing, repentant sinner, know, believe that in Christ you are forgiven. We'll continue in our worship now, hearts inspired by the majesty of our King, singing as Jennifer plays for us. Let us stand again.
seated. And as you have uh, received so freely, now see if in your heart you would freely give as we receive our morning tithes and offerings. <coughs> Boys and girls, there it is. Uh, time for our children's message. Meet me up front. <coughs> Hi. Glad to see you. Uh, here's our verse for today. <clears throat> <clears throat> Jesus is saying this. He says, you are right in saying I am a king. You are right in saying I am a king. What do you want to be when you grow up? Have you thought about it much? You're a bit, a bit young, but Zoe says she's been thinking about it. What do you think you want to be? No? No? Kind of want to be a singer. Wow. I want to be a cowboy. You want to be a cowboy? All right. That'd be wonderful. Yes, Eli? I want to be his cowboy neighbor. You want to be his cowboy neighbor? <laughs> that sounds good. Side by side. Partners right to the end. Okay. That's good to hear. Well, you've got a lot of time to think about that, but it's good to be thinking and good to be planning a little bit. People are in all kinds of jobs. They have all kinds of work. Your moms and dads, if your mom's working, your dad's working, they got jobs. Some people are in the military, they're soldiers or they're airmen or sailors. Some people change jobs. They may start out with one thing and go to another during the course of their life. Uh, Jesus had jobs. Did you think about that, that Jesus had jobs? Can you think of any jobs that Jesus had? Uh, taking care of his people. Taking care of his people. That's one of his jobs, exactly right. When he was a young man, just growing up, he had a really ordinary job. He was a carpenter with his father in the carpentry shop. What do you think, Eli? Um, yeah, he also had to do all his chores and stuff. Had to do his chores and stuff. He was a good boy, very obedient to his parents, so I'm sure they had some chores for him to do. He had jobs. You think they had a job jar in his house? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say that. And then, he, then when he got into his ministry, he was taking care of his people, he was a preacher, he was a teacher, and he healed people who were sick. So in that way, he was sort of like a special kind of doctor, making people well. He had lots of jobs. There are some special jobs that we think about that are, are way, way up above any ordinary job like a carpenter. He had the job of being a prophet, that he spoke for God, a priest, he offered sacrifices for, to God, and then a king. Today we're thinking about Jesus as king. What do you think a king does? Have you ever met a king? I never met a king. Well, I'm one. And, and in one, one sense, Dan King, but I'm not really a king. But um, what do you think a king does? Does he, does he um, 
sit back all day and count his money, count his gold and his silver? No. No, you don't think so? Does he sit back and figure out ways that he can boss people around? No. You don't think so? Well, when Jesus was, as Jesus reigns as king, he doesn't do those things either. He is a good king. And he does what good kings do. And what good kings do is they defend their people. They protect their people. And they provide for their people. They give their people whatever they need to be healthy and happy and living, living at peace. That's the kind of king that Jesus is. Always a good king. Now, when you think about Jesus as king, that means that we are under him and he reigns over us and he commands us, but not to hurt us or to limit us or to make our lives hard. He reigns over us to make our lives good, to make our lives blessed. And because he is a king who lives forever, you know what we can feel? We can feel safe. We can feel thankful. And we can feel like we want to worship such a good king. Let's pray and worship him now a little, with a little prayer. King Jesus, accept our thanks for reigning over us in a way that protects us, in a way that provides for our needs. You're a good and faithful king, and we honor you. Amen. Thanks, boys and girls. <laughs>
wrote about these strange lines, which can be found in the plains of Peru. They're canals, apparently drainage ditches for all anybody knew for the longest time, interlinking, interconnected, um, totally undecipherable at ground level. The assumption had been all along that these were drainage ditches or canals dug by some ancient civilization, long, long forgotten. But then in 1939, Dr. Paul Kosak of Long Island University discovered their true meaning, but that meaning was delayed until technology had advanced to the place that you could get up in an airplane and get high above these lines and above these channels and above these canals. And what was discovered there is it viewed from that elevation, these were really enormous drawings, prehistoric art, a monkey in this case, and, and others, birds and insects and uh, patterns etched into the earth. And they went on acre after acre. You needed a special perspective to appreciate it. And in a similar way, people often think of the Bible as individual disconnected little stories, a little squib here, a little line there, but no particular relationship. But if we survey Scripture as a whole, we will discover pretty obviously that this is, after all, one great story of redemption from the opening scenes in Genesis to the final chapter of, of Revelation. And weaving through all the diverse strands of this Bible storyline, the overarching story becomes what God has been up to in order to redeem His people, to rescue His people, this world of fallen human beings, what He has been up to from the first nanosecond of creation to the final shout of victory in the end. Now that kind of thing certainly applies to the Bible's teaching on the kingly reign of Christ. This is a major theme in Scripture. You may not acknowledge it as such, but it is true, arching over everything from beginning to end. But like the lines in the desert, it is a complex matter. It needs a certain perspective. Sometimes it's hard to bring all these lines into focus. There can be no doubt, certainly, however, that God wants us to see Christ as king. When the Magi came from the east to inquire of Herod, they asked, where is he? Where is this one who has been born king of the Jews? And of course, Herod is shaken by that suggestion of a rival king, and this murderous rage boils over toward all the male infants of his realm. It was seen then that the wise men and the historical homicidal king were alike in that they were familiar with these ancient prophecies, saying that a king was to arise, a certain king, a special king. As far back as Moses, uh, Balaam was found to be declaring, a star will come out of Jacob, a scepter will rise out of Israel. Take a giant leap forward to the time of King David. We hear the Lord himself reveal his dynastic purposes. He says, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. 300 years later, Isaiah prophesying concerning a child to be born, a son to be given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. He will reign on David's throne from that time on and forever. Fast forward 700 years more to hear Gabriel's words, do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, the throne and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. And then uh, a scant 30 years later, John the Baptist appears, this latter day Elijah, proclaiming that this long, long prophesied kingdom of God was just on the horizon of history. As Dr. Sinclair Ferguson notes in Table Talk magazine, John the Baptist's message was both echoed by and fulfilled in his cousin, Jesus of Nazareth. That message, repent, 
For the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand. Now at last, at last, in the arrival of King Jesus, the kingdom is here. It is visible. The king himself had arrived. But what does that mean to say that Jesus is king? Well, we could personalize it and say, yes, I understand. Jesus has come to be king of my life. But that would be just a, a sliver of the reality. There's a much greater gospel story than this. Something much more anchored in the history of God's revelation. Something much more cosmic in its implications. In fact, when Jesus first announced his kingship, two parts of it were already in place by the time the announcement came. First, he had already been anointed. He had already been Christed into the office of king by the coming of the Holy Spirit at the time of his baptism in the Jordan River, heaven opening there, the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven saying, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. His anointing. But even more than that, because secondly, his baptism was followed by an immediate conflict. Immediately after his baptism, Jesus went to war a conflict face-to-face -face with Satan himself, the wilderness temptations. Jesus led by the Spirit into the desert for a period of 40 days where he was tempted by the devil. This is where he began to set the parameters of his kingdom. Because in this, Jesus proved to be everything that Adam and Israel had failed to be. Jesus triumphed where they had failed. How did it go? The tempter came to him and said, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. In other words, no, I will not discount the word of God and seek my ultimate sustenance in some other place. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands. Jesus answered, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. In other words, no, I will not trifle with God by presuming on his grace and mercy. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. King Jesus triumphed precisely where God's people had failed. God's people then and God's people now. They had discounted God's word. Jesus said he would live by that word, nothing less than that word. They had sinfully tried God's patience. Jesus said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And oh, had they ever raised up other gods in God's place. Jesus said, worship and serve God only. King Jesus had triumphed because that's what kings do. That's what good kings do. King Jesus triumphed precisely where God's first earthly vice-regent had failed. Adam the first, well, he was a king of sorts, created to reign, a co-regent to reign on God's behalf, being created in God's own image. Adam had discounted God's word. Adam had tried God's patience. Adam had raised up other gods in God's place. After the siege of Baghdad, the thing that uh, stuck in our minds and will perhaps forever, most memorable, the toppling of the statue of Saddam Hussein. Such a potent image. It speaks and it speaks and it speaks. The symbolism comes through. We understand it. It meant that Saddam was no longer in power. He was no longer reigning over Iraq. His image was there on display, and while it stood, it spoke of his dominance, his dominion, his reign over that realm. 
And he wasn't the only one to do such a thing, of course. It's long been that way. In the ancient Near East especially, a king might symbolize his lordship over a city or over a region by setting up a representation of himself. It's been known to be a statue also. An image of some kind symbolizing his dominion, a, 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 a statue of a pharaoh, a bust of a king somewhere. This is precisely what Genesis 1 describes. God, the great king, made man as his living, breathing, moving, like himself image, and gave Adam first dominion. Adam ruled over all that God had made. Not only was Adam to rule over all in God's behalf, but he was to turn the whole earth into the garden of God. So, Genesis reads, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule. The God who is king of the universe in his infinite wisdom and amazingly beautiful plan fashioned a creature who in miniature could experience creativity, could experience dominion, could express that, and so could have real fellowship with his maker, and his likeness to God would be the sign of God's own rule and reign through him. And so here was the genius of the serpent's subtlety. You will be like God. He tempted Eve with those words. And she and her husband fell for it because they forgot the fundamental truth. They were already like God. So Adam the first fell, and with him the cosmos. Enter Adam the last, the Lord Jesus, anointed to kingly office by the Holy Spirit. The replay of the battle, not in a garden now, but in this wilderness scene this wilderness that sin had wrought. And in this wilderness, the beasts that surround him were not subservient, they weren't tame. The plants there were not lush with fruit falling off the vine. The animals were wild. The entire environment was hostile. Nevertheless, Adam the last faced the same temptations to which Adam the first fell, and Israel following him. And, well, how about you and me? But King Jesus overcame them. He was triumphant. He routed their author. The prince of this world offered the kingdom to Jesus, but in a way that would make Jesus always subject to him. If you worship me, I will give all this to you. But the prince of darkness is no match for the son of light. And so anticipating this much more bloody battle at the cross, Jesus stands firm. And so now in one man, and this man from heaven, a foothold a foothold is gained in enemy-occupied territory. A life-threatening wound was there inflicted upon the enemy. The kingdom of God had come near. But a final battle for dominion remained. God had promised a day of bloody conflict between the seed of the woman and the serpent. The seed of the woman his heel would be bruised even as he crushed the serpent's head. This God had decreed before all time. This God would do. The two warriors moved irrevocably towards the final battle. God's battle plan is in place. Satan, seeing his opportunity, now rushes to destroy the son, God's king, and seemingly succeeds. He who holds the power of death had the last Adam in his clutches. But this is a king who gave himself and who died voluntarily, bearing the guilt for the sins of his own. And so truly such a God-man, such a one as this, could not be held down. And so Christ triumphed over Satan in the cross, to all appearances contrary. And in his resurrection and ascension, experienced his coronation, received the Father's authority to give to people the same Spirit who had anointed him, and the Spirit of the King is poured out on his subjects so that of the increase of his government there would be no end. And peace. And so today, 
men and women, and boys and girls, young and old, rich and poor, wise and simple, from the world's tribes and languages and peoples and nations, bow the knee and call Him Lord. We do not see everything under the God-man's feet, not everything in submission, not yet, but we see Jesus already crowned because He has tasted death for us. We see Him by faith, and we realize that His enthroned presence in heaven now, this morning, today, is the guarantee that He shall return to consummate, to bring in its fullness this now inaugurated kingdom. And at that time, the last word will be spoken. And at that time, the last reversal will take place. J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, that trilogy, is the second best-selling novel ever written. The last title in that three-book series is The Return of the King. And in the return of the king, the hero, Aragorn, is the rightful claimant to the throne, the throne in Gondor, but he has to fight for it. In one scene, he returns to the city of Minas Tirith. A great battle has been raging. He's been victorious in defeating the dark lord Sauron, but Aragorn Aragorn is not yet able to ascend to the throne, to claim it finally and fully. So he enters the city in disguise. He is en route to the houses of healing, and there he seeks to minister to his friends, his fellow warriors who've been wounded in battle. His ability to heal is to be the absolute mark, guarantee of his true identity, that this is indeed the king. Because according to an ancient verse that's repeated by an old woman who served in the houses of healing, the hands of the king are the hands of a healer. And so the rightful king could ever be known. One of the wounded warriors there close to the king is a man named Faramir. I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs of their conversation. Now Aragorn knelt beside Faramir and held a hand upon his brow. And those that watched felt that some great struggle was going on. For Aragorn's face grew gray with weariness. And ever and anon he called the name of Faramir, but each time more faintly to their hearing, as if Aragorn himself was removed from them and walked afar in some dark veil, calling for the one who was lost. Suddenly Faramir stirred, and he opened his eyes, and he looked on Aragorn who bent over him, and a light of knowledge and love was kindled in his eyes, and he spoke softly, My Lord, you called me. I come. What does the king command? Walk no more in the shadows, but awake, said Aragorn. I will, Lord, said Faramir, for who would lie idle when the king has returned? Farewell then for a while, said Aragorn, I must go to others who need me. And he left the chamber. And then the old woman who had recited the ancient lines about the healer king was heard to exclaim as he exited, King, King, did you hear that? What did I say? The hands of a healer, I said. And soon the word had gone out from the house that the king was indeed come among them. And after war brought healing. And the news ran through the city. And so, with King Jesus, this new order begun in His resurrection, really existing now, will will spread to everything that He claims, and that is everything. Not one inch accepted, the theologian once said. The groans of creation written by the, about by the apostle in Romans, those groans will be heard no longer as one risen with healing in his wings. The true king returns, and everything, everywhere will be seen the reflections of his perfect glory, and loud voices 
by the millions will be heard saying in heaven, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. All hail King Jesus. Let us pray. Lord, show yourself to us in your glory and your majesty. Lift the veil from our eyes. Remove the temerity found so often in our faith and make us bold to believe, bold to proclaim, bold to search out these truths and the evidence of their reality in the circumstances of this world as we live in it today. O oh, King Jesus, thank you for the comfort of knowing that we belong to you. Thank you for the assurance that we have one who defends us and provides for us. Fill us with thanksgiving for the certainty that the battle is finished and this cleaning up operation has a definite duration. For your own name's sake, we pray. Amen. Please stand and sing. People of God, now receive the blessings of God. May the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you with every good thing to do His will, working in you that which is pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever. Amen.